All right. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining uh, this uh, webinar, the third in a series of three presented by Jay on this theme of trust in uh, upstream uh, data. The title of today's webinar, Trustworthy to Trusted, Building Consumer Confidence in Your Data Assets, was delivered as a paper at the PNEC conference in May of this year. Um, the two previous presentations are already available on our website under our library, and we will be posting a recording of this uh, webinar also on the website, uh, probably later today. So without further ado, um, I will pass the hand to Jay, who will be um, conducting this webinar. You can put questions. Uh, there's a button at the bottom of the screen to put written questions, and we'll address those at the end of his presentation. Jay, if you want to take over. OK, thanks. Thanks, Phil. And welcome, everybody, to, as Phil said, part three of what's now a uh, became a three-part presentation about trust and trustworthiness, trustworthiness in data. So the first thing we're going to do is summarize the the theories of trustworthiness that we've been talking about in the previous webinars. Uh, then we're going to add to that to uh, describe how this mysterious thing called metadata is used uh, to improve the trustworthiness of data um, as it goes from your data store to a user, uh, and then describe some ways we could use uh, standards to transport this metadata um, and and go into a little bit without too much technical detail in how those supporting objects that could transport metadata could look. So the summary of the first uh, of these webinars is really around what trust and trusted data is actually all about. Um, so the graph in the lower right um, is from the original article that started a lot of this thinking about uh, how much time technical professionals, uh, I like to call them knowledge workers, uh, how much time they spend actually getting their job done versus doing other things. Uh, and according to this article, um, they spend 18% of their time doing useful work and the rest of their time doing other stuff. And they used to call it looking for data. Uh, but the truth is that we know that geoscientists don't actually spend 60% of the time looking for data. Um, what they're really doing is they've, they've found some data, uh, but now they need to get it all uh, correctly reformatted. Uh, they need to make sure it all hangs together as a single geological model, get the coordinate reference systems the same. Um, get the units of measure con, uh, consistent w among the different data sets and all of that typical work that people are used to and and uh, this there's now a word for this we didn't used to have a word for this uh, the word for this is now data wrangling uh, or data munging some people call it and uh, this is actually not a waste of time uh, when you're going through your data and and looking at it to make sure it all seems to be correct or making some uh, changes to it. Uh, you gain a lot of insights sometimes uh, just by working with the data before you formally begin to do your interpretation. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, at the end of the day, a knowledge worker is going to keep doing this data wrangling until they're satisfied that the data that they're working with uh, is sufficiently well integrated and of sufficient quality that they can trust it. And they'll keep doing this work if it's a month, if it's three months, they'll spend this time doing whatever they need to do to get to the point where they feel they can trust the data that they're going to use to make some decision or some interpretation. And it's that time period uh, that people are after when they're trying to say they want to reduce this uh, time people spend looking for data. But the, the issue isn't so much looking as it is an issue of trust. So trusted data isn't exactly the same thing as high quality data. Uh, the word data quality, the phrase data quality, uh, has not a specific definition. And in fact, it, it has different meanings depending on the context. Uh, but the truth is, 
you have to make decisions with the data that you have. So you, everyone knows that the gas gauge in their car isn't accurate. Some cars, the needle can go far below the E. Some cars, it's halfway between a quarter full and empty that the car begins to run poorly. So you, you learn in your own individual car kind of where that point is, but the, the underlying point for this discussion is that even though you know that's a poor quality measurement device, you still pull into a gas station when it gets to a certain point. So you can make a decision without having to have extremely high accuracy, high quality data. And the flip side is there are some things that are perfectly well measured that people don't like to have trust or confidence in. And so my example here is, is the amount of calories in the food you eat. You know, there's a device called the bomb calorimeter. There's a picture of one on the lower, lower right uh, that measures very accurately how many calories there are in an item of food. Uh, but people still don't trust it. They think, uh, well, it's it's always too high. Uh, but the point is that uh, a knowledge worker is going to keep doing this data munging until they trust the data that they're working with. Um, and if they're forced to use data they don't trust, uh, then they're, they'll be constantly uncomfortable with the, the results and will, in fact, doubt their own interpretations. So high-quality data isn't the same as trusted data. Trusted data means I trust it to be able to use it for the purpose to which I'm going to put it. Uh, that's not the same thing as I absolutely positively must have perfect high quality data for every decision that I make. Um, so when we uh, think about whether a particular piece of data is trustworthy or not, uh, then uh, we can wonder where that sense of trustworthiness comes from. And that trust uh, partly comes from the source. Uh, so there are many sources of data that we'll trust and say, well, I believe my company's official data store. I believe Jay down the hall does a good job, so I'll ask him to give me the data. Uh, and then the data itself will then be trusted because the source of the data was considered to be trustworthy. Um, a, second, a second reason that we might trust data is that we know where it came from. Um, I inherently know that if I have a piece of sensor data that came to me directly from the field, no human has touched it, um, and I know its units of measure, I can trust that that's the best measurement I'm going to get for that uh, for that property, uh, as opposed to a piece of data that somebody might have faxed someplace uh, 15 years ago, and then somebody hand typed it into a database, and then that was printed out, and somebody else typed it into something else. You know, and that extra handling uh, means that I'll have less trust in that data. Uh, I'll also have less trust in the data if I don't even know how it was handled. If I'm simply given a piece of information and, and said, right, use this, I have no reason to trust it since I don't know where it came from or I don't know how it's been handled since it was generated. You know, and, and, and finally, this is a little bit less relevant in oil and gas, but uh, the lineage of a data in a security sense, uh, if I can I be confident that the piece of data I've been given hasn't been intentionally tampered with uh, by some hacker or somebody in the middle? Uh, that's a little bit more relevant for, for financial kind of information, but it could happen in, uh, in oil and gas information. So those three things, the so original source, how the data has been handled and computed since it left its source, and whether the data could have been tampered with maliciously uh, by some kind of hacker. Those are the three uh, sources of trustworthiness that result in a feeling of trust on the part of a knowledge worker. In the second presentation, we went into quite a bit of detail about measurement information and the fact that uh, if I'm going to trust a measurement that comes from the field, uh, there are quite a few things. There are nine things, I think, on this particular slide. but. Uh, you have to sort of realize that if I want to measure a flow rate, for example, you can't measure flow rate. Uh, you can measure some pressures and temperatures, 
and you can calculate a flow rate, but you don't actually directly measure a flow rate. Uh, so almost never can we directly measure the thing that we want to measure. We measure other things and then we calculate the thing that we want from those measurements. Uh, and then uh, we often can't measure what we want to measure at the place we want. So we don't lower uh, an infinite number of permanent tools down uh, a producing well, but we still estimate what the, let's say the flowing bottom hole pressure is. We seldom ever measure the flowing bottom hole pressure. We measure the wellhead uh, pressure, and then we calculate uh, using chemical engineering calculations, we calculate the flowing bottom hole pressure. Uh, so we seldom ever actually measure that, uh, but we'll still report that reading. It may appear as a tag and a historian, but it's calculated. Uh, so, and so forth and so forth. So uh, there's quite a list of information that one needs to really know in order to be certain that a, something that's reported as a measurement uh, is actually trustworthy. You know, the, the sensor could be out of calibration. If I don't know where the reading was taken, I might have something that's called flowing pressure on a well, and I don't know if that's the surface pressure or the bottom hole pressure, because I don't know where that, that sensor was located. Uh, and then for high accuracy work, there's also problems in the conversion of an analog reading from an electrical device to the digital values that we use when we put those in a computer. So all of this stuff means that there are sources of uncertainty uh, around uh, sensor data, and those sources of uncertainty add up to be uh, a source of uh, mistrust on the part of a user. Uh, and we said at this at the conclusion of that of the second webinar that users build trust in a source of data if they have access to that information they won't check it every time they won't look at every single sensor to see when it was last calibrated but it by the action of simply having access to that information that they are they're confident that if they wanted to find out when was this sensor last calibrated where was it located uh, what are its appropriate uh, temperature range for which it's a valid reading, those kinds of things. If the user simply has access to that data, then they'll trust that source of data more, even if they don't literally check it on every piece of information they're using. So that was the aspects of trust as it relates to measurement data. So in this third and final webinar, we're going to talk about how that information, how all of that contextual information kind of moves around. And in big corporations, uh, there are often projects, IT projects in big corporations, which are, are around creating trusted data. Sometimes those projects will have the word trust in the projects. And from an enterprise IT perspective, they typically will say this, that in order to have trusted data, we want to have a catalog of where all the data sources are, which is good. Uh, we want to create some standard processes uh, around use of our data and identifying when data comes into and out of an organization, how it's registered and uh, how it's entered into that catalog. Uh, standards will be created around names or lists of values, uh, ownership. So these are the sort of things that the Data Management Association, uh, the Data Management Body of Knowledge uh, addresses. And these are all very good and necessary things from data management. Some people will have a data quality program to clean up some data and establish some ongoing monitoring processes. Uh, but the truth is that just because these IT projects have been run, it doesn't mean that users are going to trust the data that come, that results from these IT projects. Uh, users have to build up that trust over time by using the information and uh, discovering whether it was actually trustworthy or not. So uh, we're gonna discuss the rest of this talk, some things that you could be doing as an IT person uh, to help convey that information and make it available to a user so that they know they have it available. And once they know they have it available, 
the simple fact of knowing it's available improves increases their trust in the use of that source of data. So uh, trust is a delicate thing. And unfortunately, uh, once you lose trust in something, uh, it's very difficult to get that trust back. And I've begun reading a lot of psychology kind of articles, uh, psychology papers about what happens when trust is lost. Uh, and psychologists use the word betrayal. Uh, and betrayal is a bad thing. And especially uh, amusingly for people that are sort of moderately mild, obsessive compulsive kind of people. And unfortunately, that's a lot of the folks that we deal with in the, in the data side. Uh, so, uh, and, and we know from movies, you know, the old movie Play Misty for Me, or people remember the movie Misery, that, uh, you know, when an author loses the trust of his uh, fans, bad things can happen. So, simply calling something trusted isn't enough. Uh, it's an emotional thing, and it requires just constant availability of proof that the uh, data that I'm giving you is indeed trustworthy. Uh, so to create that, uh, to restore that sense of trust in a source of data, uh, it's really all about conveying contextual information about the, about the data. If I'm going to give you a piece of data, the user will trust it once they know where it came from, how it's been handled, the fact that it hasn't been tampered with, that's what will rebuild that confidence is to make that available. And the way that you carry all that contextual information is this word metadata. Uh, a lot of people have a lot of different definitions for metadata, and I'm going to present a few of those definitions here and suggest the one that I think is the most appropriate. So everybody says metadata is data about data or information about data, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, remember that metadata itself is data. So many times in one context, somebody will refer to metadata, uh, but in a different context, that information isn't metadata, it's the data. So from a geospatial perspective, uh, the data is the geospatial shape and where it exists in three-dimensional space. Everything else about it is metadata. So if, it's a, if it happens to be a well uh, and it has production and it, it has well markers as the well penetrates different geologic strata and so forth, from a geospatial perspective, that's all metadata. Uh, the data is where is the trajectory of that well bore in three-dimensional space. So that's a pretty narrow perspective, but it's an important one in the oil and gas industry. And uh, as you go from one sort of domain to another one, you find that sometimes what I think is metadata, somebody else thinks is data. So when you're dealing in this metadata world, you just have to keep that in mind that uh, you may have to switch your terminology uh, depending on the context you're working in. The first metadata that mankind knows about uh, is f libraries where uh, a library would have many books and uh, someplace there would be information about those books stored. Uh, and this is some examples from the Royal Library of Ashurbanipal. Uh, and it's cuneiform writing, and it's the first sort of library card catalog uh, that describes the documents that were held in this royal library. And as it happens, uh, these are in the British Museum uh, in London. That's the first metadata that we know about. The word metadata seems to have been coined in 1967 uh, in, this con in, this, uh, in this report from MIT. Uh, and this is the first occurrence of the phrase metadata. And then as a single joined word, uh, uh, without a space. This seems to be the first reported use of it. So it's a recent word. The concept itself, to think about it so clearly, that it's information about data, uh, that whole line of thinking originated in the 60s. And uh, there are 
giving a definition of metadata, which is a data element about a second data element, so, or about a first data element. So data about data is more or less the definition that they've used. So there are three kinds of metadata. Three, uh, I'm going to categorize metadata in three ways. The first way is that there is metadata about something, but the thing has no idea that somebody's recording metadata about it. So here's an example of a book. And I mentioned this book earlier. It's the Data Management Body of Knowledge from the Data Management Association. Uh, and in fact, uh, there is an internationally available uh, set of information about this book. It's called WorldCat, or it's, it's accessed various ways that's used by libraries. So this is the entry for this particular book. And it knows who published it and when and who the authors were and, and that kind of information. But the book itself doesn't hold this metadata. Uh, as some of it may be contained someplace in the book, but it's not held as a specific piece of metadata. So the book is unaware that somebody is keeping track of it. And of course, this particular metadata entry is in German. So that's a, another problem of, of this metadata is you, have, you, you the source of the metadata itself might not be understandable or even written in the same language as the uh, piece of data itself. And this is a, on the lower right is a photograph of an old fashioned card catalog from a library. Interestingly, um, some of these card catalogs, uh, there was a one to one relationship between a card in a drawer and the item itself, a book. Sometimes a card catalog was organized in such a way that the catalog described a, uh, a kind of book and that when you went to the shelf, you might find six copies of the same book and they would be labeled copy one, copy two, et cetera. Uh, but the card catalog might not know that. So in this particular case, uh, this card catalog is identifying a specific instance of a book. The second kind of metadata is some is a kind of metadata that I call data metadata by reference, where the piece of data itself actually knows there's metadata. It doesn't know the metadata, but it's carrying along with the data a reference to where you go to get the data, to get that metadata. So on a modern book, um, there's a barcode on the back. And the barcode, this barcode actually encodes two different kinds of metadata. Uh, one of these kinds of metadata is an international standard book number. So I can look that number up and I can find metadata about the book, who published it. And this happens to be a book that our organization published 15 years ago uh, um, about a, 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 an exchange format from POSC. So the book itself knows that there is metadata and it gives you a pointer for how to get that metadata. The second kind of barcode that you could find on a book is a, is a code that specifically identifies this copy of a book. And that would be something like in an inventory system. So I might have a reference that's contained right in the book itself to, to point to metadata about this specific instance of a book so this book actually could have two kinds of ref references to two different kinds of metadata on the back. Uh, the kind of metadata that's the most efficient, though, is what I call intrinsic metadata. And that's where the thing being described actually carries with it all of the metadata that's needed for a particular purpose. So here we're going to use the example of a pet. So we have a puppy, and for those people who are not dog people, let's say you could have a kitten. So what I really want to know is some metadata about this item. I want to know who owns it, where it lives, if it has medical problems. I'd like to know something about that, but I want that metadata to actually be carried along with the thing that's being described so that the metadata is constantly available. If you have the thing, 
then you have the metadata about it. And of course, you can all guess what that is. It's the, the chip that you put in a pet. Uh, there is, in fact, an ISO standard for how the chip works. And interestingly, uh, until 2018, it was metadata by reference. So if you put a chip in your dog, uh, then if the dog is found then and scanned, the metadata about the dog would be found on the internet by reference. But as of the 2018 version of this ISO standard, you can now encode in the chip itself the name of the pet's owner, their phone number, et cetera. Uh, so there's a new generation of pet chips that are possible according to the new version of the ISO standard. So now your pet actually can have all of the metadata contained right inside the pet. And that's the best kind of metadata where uh, when an item of data is being moved around in a system, it carries along with it all of the information that's important about its quality, where it came from, what its lineage is, uh, whether the sensors were calibrated. You want all of that information to travel right along with the metadata. And we have examples of these. A Word document. When you open up a Word document, there is a little metadata record associated with the Word document. Most people have seen this uh, in Microsoft Office products. The metadata is right there inside the document. If I have a seismic tape, a SegWise seismic tape contains metadata about the tape right on the tape. And that's the what we used to call the EBCDIC header. It's now called the textual header because it can be ASCII. But you have the, the EBCDIC header and the binary file header. And that's information about the reel of tape. Uh, that's right on the reel of tape itself. Intrinsic metadata. Now, if we just could have tapes that don't have lots of extra metadata stuck all over the outside of the tape, look at just how many times that tape has had a different identifier associated with it and different systems over its life. Um, and a third way, uh, example of it, is something that uh, a standard that the Energistics uh, community created and that we steward, which is called the Energistics Energy Industry Profile of ISO 19115. Uh, the ISO standard ISO 19115 is a uh, geographical information metadata standard, but uh, some people in the Energistics community realize that, in fact, uh, this metadata was suitable for any sorts of information, and it had the benefit that in addition to being suitable for any kind of data, it also contained the coordinate reference system and geospatial sort of information that's significant for that portion of the oil and gas industry. Uh, so that particular standard, unfortunately, is very large and kind of complicated. So this group of people created what we call a profile. Uh, a profile is simply a subset of this larger standard uh, that that we think is appropriate for upstream oil and gas data. Uh, and so they created uh, a, a tiny subset of this much larger standard, uh, and that's available on the Energistics website as the Energy Industry Profile, EIP of ISO 19115. So that's another great example of a way that you could carry some metadata right along with a data set. Uh, so here is a great definition of metadata. I would remark that this comes from the National Information Standards Organization. They published this definition in 2004. Since then, they've made a different definition that I don't think is as, uh, as, as powerful as this definition. So really, there are some aspects of this metadata definition that I like. Metadata is structured, right? A whole bunch of text, a textual description of something isn't easily consumable by a computer. So I like the fact that metadata, this definition says it's structured information. It describes a piece of information, it explains what it's for, and it locates it. It tells you where that data is available. So those are the three key things that metadata should carry within that structure. And the purpose of it is to make it easier to retrieve, use, or manage that information. So of all the definitions of metadata I've read, I think this is 
the clearest and it captures the essence of the things that you need to have proper metadata. It needs to be structured, it needs to be able to describe, explain, and locate. Different sources of information will categorize data, uh, metadata different ways. I have chosen to do it as metadata that's independent of the object, referenced by the object, or actually contained right alongside the object as the data gets transferred. Uh, but there are a few other ways that people break metadata up into different categories, and uh, I have links to these sources if people are interested. But, uh, but the point is that uh, everyone agrees that this metadata uh, is really there to, as I said in the previous slide, it's there to make it easier for people to retrieve, use, and manage all this information. So uh, there are some metadata standards. Uh, as it happens, Energistics, this energy industry profile is the only metadata standard that's specific to oil and gas. Uh, but there is quite a there are quite a few, and there's uh, uh, this place in Edinburgh, in Scotland, the Digital Curation Centre has a website where they actually attempt to maintain a list of metadata standards that exist, and they uh, specific standards exist in many domains. Uh, and then there are generic standards like the one I just showed from ISO. Uh, but the, if you're interested in this topic in general, the list from the Digital Curation Center is a pretty good list. And then plus there is a Wikipedia page about metadata that also has a list. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, if you're looking for oil and gas related metadata, the energy industry profile is the only one uh, that's specific to oil and gas. So where does this, where should this metadata come from? So if I'm gonna have these descriptions, uh, I really want to not have it be typed in manually by a human. So the best source for metadata is getting as close to its original uh, generator as possible. So for real-time data, that would be a sensor. Uh, the sensor itself, uh, is the best place to know uh, wh whether its reading is good or not, what the ambient temperature is, possibly. Uh, if, if, it's, if it's out in the open air, it can know the ambient temperature. Uh, it knows when it was last calibrated. So there are, that's the best source. Uh, but uh, failing having the sensor available in real time to know that, then you start moving backwards through the chain. So instead of talking to the sensor in real time, I may be able to find an archive of that sensor data over time, like in a historian uh, or in some other master data store. Uh, then uh, the next best source is calculated information. So again, if I have some calculated information, if I know that I have a reading for uh, water saturation uh, from downhole tools in a producing well or an exploration well. Uh, I want to know was that using Archie's equation? You know what what sort of information was? What sort of algorithms and parameters were used to make those calculations? So again, the application that does those calculations is the best source for that metadata, rather than uh, trying to consult a book and and see which which calculation would have been used. Uh, interpretation software is another great source for metadata. Uh, if the vendors of uh, geoscience, and, you know, geophysical, geological interpretation actually moved along with the data a little piece of information to say, yes, here is a data set and this came from uh, a creaking or a co-creaking application, and here was the algorithm I used, and this was the value for nugget and the value for sill, and and the the different parameters that I used in my creaking algorithm. Uh, at the time it did those calculations, the application knew what it was doing. It just should have recorded a little tiny metadata element along with it to to record what it did, um, and that's the best source. Uh, is the calculation uh, program itself. Uh, 
Uh, finally, you know, you have other sources of metadata like we would think about that would be something more from a like a library or some static source. And then finally, somebody could actually hand type some of this metadata. But the closer you can get to the original source and having that metadata traveling along with the information from its original source is really the best source of any kind of metadata. So when we think about what kind of metadata are we moving, uh, again, uh, as I said in the beginning, it's really about is the source of data trustworthy? Was the sensor calibrated? Did it conform to what the contract said the measurement contractor needed to do? And, and that's the sort of thing that we call data assurance, uh, which uh, basically a lot says that a piece of information conforms to the contractual requirements uh, that the purchaser uh, agreed with the measurement contractor uh, that the data would conform to. Uh, and then, of course, anything that's been done to the data since it left that point, what calculations were made on it, using what algorithms, by whom. Uh, so that data assurance bit and then the data provenance, those are the two critical aspects of moving this contextual information along with the data. So the key in data management is to remember that we are managing the data, but we also need to manage that metadata so that we can present that information to the end user and uh, enable the end user to decide whether it's suitable for whatever purpose it's, it's needed for. So energistic standards help with all of this by in fact having explicit data objects that carry this information right alongside the actual information itself. And we have objects which literally are called, one of them is called data assurance. Uh, and data assurance, as I said a moment ago, is really does the data I'm sending you conform to the rules that you expected it to follow? And then we have something that in energistic standards is called the activity data object. And the activity data object allows you to capture at whatever level of detail you'd like uh, which steps were used in creating that piece of information, what algorithms were used, what parameters were used within those algorithms, uh, as detail or as summary as you'd like. Uh, there's no part of the standard that forces you to carry any uh, onerous amount of information. It just really depends upon a transaction between a sender and a receiver as to how much information the receiver would like the sender to send it. So these two objects, the combination of the data assurance and the activity object, which move along with the data, uh, are those carriers for that contextual information. And that's how the energistic suite of standards enables you to move all of this stuff. And then the fact that it's available to a user gives the user confidence that they can use that data because they always know that, well, if I have some question, I'll just go look in the metadata and I can find out whether, you know, whether it was too hot that day for that sensor to be a good, uh, for the sensor reading to be good. Uh, so they're much more likely to use the data because they have that information. So at a slightly higher level, when we think about all of our data objects, we have this energy industry profile metadata and it's in every uh, a small part of that energy industry profile metadata is in every one of our data objects. The data assurance can be there. The activity data object can be there. And uh, the community is now working on a much higher level notion of uh, uncertainty in being able to keep track of scenarios and cases. You know, So I have some data here, but this is my highest probability geological scenario or my lowest probability geologic scenario and being able to track those sorts of things as metadata along with this more detailed data assurance and provenance that we would carry with the activity objects 
uh, carrying those higher level concepts from an interpretation or engineering design perspective um, uh, will kind of complete the picture at, from the high scale down to the most detailed scale. Uh, and that's the way our objects work. And, you know, as a kind of a, an example, this is the sorts of things that you could say if you chose to, that I'm going to create a group of rules uh, around some log data, and I'm still going to send you the data. Uh, I'm always going to send you whatever data we have, but I might like to know that this particular row uh, curve X should never be higher than curve Y, and here's a case where it is. Uh, or here's something that's missing its unit of measure, or or uh, it was supposed to be regularly sampled in some time sense, but uh, for whatever reason, the data between 1 minute 15 and 2 minutes 13, the data didn't come. So there's some missing information. Uh, these are the kinds of rules that you could, if the rules existed, uh, you could use the data assurance object to pass this information that the data we're sending you fails the rules that you had established in advance. So in closing, it's simply a fact that knowledge workers uh, are going to munge their data and they're going to work with their data until they trust it. What they really want is a trusted data set to do their work. Uh, and that trust means it's suitable for the task that I'm going to be doing. And the key to making giving users that trust is to make this contextual metadata available. Uh, and you can look it up in books and type it into a computer system, but the most effective way to get this contextual metadata is to have it come from the source along with the data so it travels through that chain of information that goes from a sensor through a SCADA system, through some sort of aggregation system to a database, you know, and it gets presented eventually to a user in some kind of user interface. Being able to have that metadata available to them uh, is what creates that trust. And moving that metadata along with the data is the only way to really ensure that everything is kept in sync and to not have to, after the fact, manually type a whole lot of information in. Uh, and so on that note, I'll close and thank you for your attention. And Phil, I guess, I don't know if we have any questions or uh, anyone has any, has typed any comments in. Do you want to explain again how people would enter questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Jay. Uh, certainly a brilliant presentation as usual. Um, as said before, the Q&A button is at the bottom of your uh, screen. If you hover towards the bottom, it should appear if it's currently not uh, showing. And you can type in a, uh, one or more questions that we'd be glad to answer. Currently, there are no questions. Was it all so crystal clear? <laughs> Well, I guess that's um, where we're going to uh, conclude the webinar then, if there are no questions. Uh, of course, at any time, you can uh, email questions to us at info at energistics.com or directly to Jay's email address that's on the screen currently. Oh, a question popped up. How does metadata facilitate AI, ML, that's artificial intelligence, machine learning, and automatic ingestion? Well, if you're going to do analytics on any kind of information, you really can't do it without knowing where is that information spatially located, what are its units of measure. Um, if you want to do detailed analysis, uh, well, let's say I, I threw out an example earlier that we don't calculate flowing 
bottom hole, we don't measure flowing bottom hole pressure typically, we measure flowing wellhead pressure and we calculate the flowing bottom hole pressure. And if you're doing some analysis, you might like to know what algorithm was used to calculate that flowing bottom hole pressure because you may disagree with that. And if some result seems to not be coming out the way you expect, uh, you might like to go back and reverse that calculation and uh, re uh, figure out what the flowing wellhead pressure was and then perform a different calculation to get to that flowing bottom hole pressure. But if you don't know what algorithm was used to calculate that flowing bottom hole pressure, then you have no chance of being able to recover uh, what, the, what the reading in the wellhead must have been if you don't have that available to you. So there's, there's example after example after example of if, if I need to do some analytics, I may pass it one time through the data and discover that there seems to be some results that are questionable. So now I need to go investigate that metadata and, uh, and uh, be able to redo something. Um, I think maybe the angle to the question here might be that whereas a human operator would uh, intuitively notice something not looking right in, in a data set, uh, we may not be able to trust an artificial intelligence system to have the same conclusions. Um, so how, mu how much of that could be addressed with a... Uh, right. Well, if you, if you think you're going to count on uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence to find the bad data for you, uh, then obviously metadata that you would carry along with the data that would describe its quality would be superior to relying on uh, some machine algorithm uh, to infer that. It's a useful tool, but it's far better to know that uh, there's a source of uncertainty in the information that travels along with the information uh, rather than hoping uh, that analytics themselves, analytics itself is going to uh, figure that out for you. Is that kind of what you're driving at, Phil? Yeah, I think that was uh, the, the sense of the question. Of course, the person asking can make context. But yeah, it's true that in a, in a world of automation and with, with volumes of data escalating uh, in size to the to the point where it's not humanly possible to, to review all the data flying through, uh, at one point we are going to have to delegate uh, to machines uh, uh, the, the ingestion and processing of the data. And, and as you say, the quality of the data and the knowledge about just how reliable the data is, is critical to that working properly. Sure, and if you, in, and if you want to tell your ingester, you know, for purposes of this particular uh, machine learning, I want you to only ingest data for uh, whose uncertainty is low, that I'm confident the data is good. Uh, but if that's, if that isn't the case, uh, I don't, let's say I don't have enough information that's, that somehow uh, passes all of my uh, data assurance rules, then I need to be prepared to uh, have an algorithm that accepts a little bit more uncertainty and then go ingest the data that uh, maybe satisfies part of our rules, but not all of our rules. So, um, right, if you're gonna do that in an automated way, uh, again, having a human go and make all those judgments manually would be totally impossible. Okay, any other questions from our audience? All right. Well, again, thank you very much, Jay, for putting this presentation together. Um, for all the other attendees, uh, it will be posted uh, as a recording on our website together with the uh, PDF of the PowerPoint. Thank you for attending this webinar, and uh, we will soon be announcing the next in this uh, 2019 series of uh, Energistics webinars. Thanks for joining us, and have a great day.